Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the webinar at TPA Global. Today's topic will be on how to deal with uncertain tax positions and the mandatory disclosure under tax six. And it will be presented by Dave Sahabraksa, CEO of TPA, Max Zao Partner, and Emily Adobe, myself. Um, just a few housekeeping matters uh, to uh, deal with it. Uh, um, everyone uh, will be automatically on the mute uh, mode. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please post it, and we will uh, answer the questions at the end. Uh, what do you say? Thank you. Uh, welcome, all of you. We uh, we had an, an interesting webinar last week on uh, comparing quantitative value chain analysis with the unified approach. So, so for that, you can still look on our, our YouTube website uh, to rerun that uh, session. Today, we will be talking about uh, the seemingly unrelated topics. One is in certain tax positions, which Mark is uh, a specialist in uh, on, and uh, the other is uh, DAC 6, which is all fresh and new and not too much uh, uh, real expertise on on the ground yet, but uh, Emily is, uh, is is the specialist on that. So the uh, approach we take, we first take a, a, a look at both of these concepts and what the criteria and hallmarks are, and then uh, start comparing both uh, to come to a, a, a conclusion where we think one uh, will influence the other. Um, so with that, I think we will start with the slide in front of us on uncertain tax positions. And uh, just uh, the scope of that it applies on income-based taxes. So if a reported tax position uh, for which the tax treatment is unclear, you need to look at the applicability of law uh, to a certain transaction or tax position and, and make known uh, whether the report a position in your tax form uh, might, with a certain probability, not be followed by the tax inspector. So here's a few uh, examples. Um, a decision not to file a tax return in a country where you might have a permanent establishment, or you've shifted uh, in a business restructuring uh, some income from one country to the other, or characterization of income. Uh, so it's something licensing income is a capital gain might have an immediate impact on uh, which which article of the treaty you apply and which allocation uh, the treaty allocates the this income item uh, to so the uh, plus uh, obviously tax planning strategies which uh, which do um, still exist although less and less uh, after perhaps uh, most of the for example, hybrid structures uh, are face, are being phased out or are on the verge of uh, phasing out with uh, most of our clients. So this is sort of setting the scene on uncertain tax positions. Uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, same um, scope of DAC 6. It's an EU directive, so it's uh, uh, imposing a mandatory reporting of what they call, and they as the, the authorities, an aggressive cross-border arrangement, which uh, has an impact on EU member states. And, uh, and basically, they uh, decided on, on about six hallmarks you need to go through. Um, this, this applies on all taxes, except uh, some indirect taxes and social contribution. So it's, it's much wise, wider than the uncertain, uh, uncertain tax positions, the UTPs. It's uh, implemented uh, and has to be implemented by the member states in the, as from January 1, 2020, uh, on reportable cross-border arrangements, uh, which and this is sort of where the backlog kicks in. So you need to go back in time. So any, any um, 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 tax structure you're looking at, um, you need to look at those tax structures who are, were effectively uh, in place of being set up effectively from 25th of June 2018. So it's a little bit walking back in time because some of these legislations are still in the making uh, in the, in the, to be embedded in the local leg legislation. So what is, what is uh, a reportable cross Border arrangement. 
uh, well, the, the term arrangement is not defined. So it is, uh, by virtue of the, the legislator, I think, uh, on purpose left vague and, and widely, uh, a wide definition is, uh, is probably going to be the interpretation by the tax authorities. The reporting needs to happen to the local tax authorities. So it's it's primarily in the country of the intermediates, and by the way, intermediates are advisors to a corporate. Um, alternatively, the uh, corporate itself could take uh, take the, the control on this reporting. And uh, when uh, the the corporate has reported something, they get a uh, registration number they can share with the intermediate, at which stage the intermediate uh, might. Uh, step away from having to report the, the case to its tax authorities. So it's a database where I think any reporting which hits that database uh, gets immediately shared with uh, all tax authorities around the EU. So it does have a different audience than the, than the UTPs, which typically go into the public domain. This goes into not a public domain database, but wide enough circulations to uh, to be worried. Um, a, a few examples, deductible cross-order payments between related parties where you pay to a parent in, uh, in Bermuda, um, or transfer pricing in the context of intercompany restructurings are, are two, two examples uh, to, you, could, you could think of. Uh, Mark, this is uh, the next slide. Thank you, Steve. Um, this slide basically uh, deals with uh, a short of text positions from an IFRS and US CAP perspective. Um, basically, the uh, standards have been convert converting to each other over the last, I would say, five, six years. Um, but looking at both standards, there are still differences. In, uh, in summary, for IFRS, the key test is whether it's more likely than not that the taxing, taxing authority will accept the company's tax treatment as reported in the uh, income tax filing. If that is the case, then uh, the company can record the same amount in the financial statement as had, had been uh, has reflected in its tax return. If this is not the case, the company needs to reflect uh, the effect of an uncertainty using the method it expects will be better uh, for the particular case, um, either uh, based on a resolution uh, with respect to uncertainty or uh, with respect to uh, expectation. Um, the IFRS um, IFRIC 23 came into place um, effectively as from January 1st, 2019. If you then subsequently look at the US GAAP, um, unlike IFRS, the US GAAP has specific guidance on the accounting for uncertainty in income taxes. And uh, unlike uh, IFRS, the benefits of uncertainty in income taxes are recognized only if it's more likely than not that the tax positions are sustained or are sustainable based on their technical merits. And that means actually that um, unlike IFRS, for tax positions that are more likely than not to be or of being sustained, the largest amount of tax benefit that is greater than 50% likely of being realized on settlement is uh, recognized. Or you can also put it differently. If you are more likely than not, you need to assess um, the amount um, which you expect um, you will be realizing a final settlement with tax authorities and the difference between 100% and that amount, which is varying between 50 and uh, let's say um, X, is uh, to be uh, included in your financial statements as a uh, provision. So then we move on to the next slide. Emily, I think this one is um, for you. It's uh, around the hallmarks of Tech 6. So, um, thank you. Thank you, Mark. 
As uh, I stated, explained earlier, for a cross-border transaction to be reportable, it needs to meet the, uh, one of the hallmarks as mentioned in the tax EU initiative. Um, as you can see on the slides, there are different types of uh, hallmarks, the um, A2E. Um, before I go over each uh, category in detail, um, it's uh, useful to know that uh, some of the hallmarks uh, in in order for an arrangement to be met under certain hallmark, the, the main benefit of uh, the, that such arrangement has to be uh, for the obtaining uh, of tax advantage, and where some of them um, you do not have to have a uh, main uh, benefit that is a tax advantage. So, for example, um, for a cross border transaction um, labeled the uh, hallmark C1. Um, if you make a, if the arrangement uh, involves uh, making a deductible payment to a related party to uh, a no tax a corporate tax jurisdiction, um, there must have been uh, a main uh, tax benefit uh, for the as the purpose of the uh, the arrangement for it to be uh, met under the hallmark. On the other hand, um, if the arrangement uh, has used uh, has involved a use of um, transfer of a hard to value intangibles, um, then that transaction, um, that arrangement, if it involves uh, an EU state, and uh, then there's, uh, if there's no need for the main uh, tax uh, benefits uh, to be met as the, uh, the main objective. Um, So as the CPA, um, as uh, we are an intermediary uh, providing uh, tax advice, we uh, do also do um, tax fix analysis. And uh, here is an example of an, an analysis we did for one of our uh, clients. So um, as you can see, we uh, review uh, what sort of work uh, performed, have we have performed. In this example, um, we provided a transfer pricing study on the unflanked margin to be retained by um, a Luxembourg company for the performance and responsibilities carried out in the intermediary finance uh, activities. Um, with uh, this particular one, um, the uh, arrangement was implemented uh, before 2025, June 2018, so it did not fall um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the category. Um, but uh, if it was, uh, this is uh, section C shows a uh, decision tree. So here are the questions that you would be asking to see if the arrangement um, does is a reportable uh, transaction. So the first uh, question you'd be uh, looking at is whether the tax arrangement involves at least one EU member. And in this case, it was yes, because um, XYZ was uh, a resident in Luxembourg. And uh, we looked uh, at whether the arrangement uh, fell, falls under one of the five categories, and in this case, it didn't. And uh, another question, the next question you'd be asking is whether um, CPA is intermediary designed, uh, design, market, organize, make available for implementation or manage the implementation of the tax arrangement. And uh, this uh, question was not applicable because uh, the arrangement itself didn't meet any of the hallmarks. Um, and uh, as a final uh, con consideration, um, we, it was not necessary to inform the client and there's no reporting obligation to uh, the EU tax authority. Yeah, and I think, uh, Emily, the, uh, the, the big question is uh, how do you organize tracking, uh, whether you're in an, uh, a corporate setting or whether you're in an intermediate setting, how do you organize the tracking of uh, of this uh, this information. So there's the, by now there's quite some software tools in the market to to actually facilitate the tracking and create a perfect audit trail. Although uh, perfect is probably overstated since uh, a lot of the uh, rules and regulations around uh, this this arrangement are still pretty vague. And uh, yeah, as the state mentions, these uh, uh, tools can be quite useful if your company has a lot of uh, cross-border arrangements. And uh, remember, there is a, a time frame as to when you have to make the reporting, which is uh, 30 days of, uh, in, um, of the implementation of the arrangements. So this uh, tool can uh, keep you track on uh, the timeliness of the reporting uh, requirements. 
Moving on to the next slide, uh, which sets out the uh, consequences, uh, the details to be uh, re reported uh, on a report of the cross-border uh, arrangement and the consequences uh, for not reporting. Um, first of all, if you have uh, decided that, that there is a reportable cross-border arrangement, the details you need to submit to the tax authority is first uh, the name of the intermediary and the taxpayer, uh, the details of the applicable hallmarks and a summary and value of the reportable arrangement and the uh, member states likely to be impacted by the uh, reportable cross-border arrangement. And uh, at the moment, uh, different the EU states have uh, different penalties for uh, non-reporting. Um, at present, in the Netherlands, um, penalties can be as much as 830,000 euros if uh, they find that uh, there was a gross negligence of deliberate actions of an intermediary uh, which resulted in missed, late or inaccurate reporting. So it puts uh, quite a lot of uh, pressure on the, the intermediaries uh, to um, make the correct uh, reporting. Um, in the UK, penalties could be up to uh, 1 million pounds and uh, in Luxembourg, uh, up to 250,000 euros of penalties can be imposed. And in France, uh, um, again, different, quite different, 10,000 euros of uh, penalties for failure to report or failure to uh, uh, notify. Yeah, one one point there is uh, the, the, the the I guess the UK and Netherlands are are sticking out in terms of a, a high fine per uh, not reported uh, while you should have been reporting. In, in Holland, the discussion has been especially if you see the word gross negligence and, or deliberate action, it, 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 it pushes you almost uh, instantly in the direction of uh, quasi-fraud or even fraud-related uh, actions. Uh, that's where the, the administrative fines, which typically are a lot lower, are out of the window. And um, for one reason or the other, the Dutch legislator has chosen to uh, consider this to be close to fraud type of actions with the subsequent high fines uh, uh, locking you in uh, per event. So, so that explains also a little bit the qualifications of how heavy the, the fine should be per, per jurisdiction is, is left at the full discretion of, uh, of the legislator. So uh, one very important question is uh, who has the uh, primary obligation to uh, make the disclosure? And in a lot of uh, instances, there can be, uh, so, th so the question is who does the have reporting have to be done by? And is it uh, one particular intermediary or is there more than one multi, uh, more than one intermediary in involved? Or is that the corporate that is the taxpayer itself? Often, um, uh, tax uh, uh, arrangement is advised by uh, the lawyer and then the, and, and the accountant, and there could be more than uh, one uh, intermediary. Um, with the uh, legal advice, lawyers, um, they are uh, pro protected with uh, legal privilege, so they are not obliged to make the obligation, and then the um, obligation would fall uh, to the, uh, the the accountant or the uh, consultant, um, or if uh, they were not, uh, or if the taxpayer was only advised by the uh, law, uh, by the lawyer, then the obligation uh, would fall on the taxpayer themselves to make the reporting requirement. Would you like to add anything to that? Okay, okay moving on to the next slide. I think, uh, Mark, uh, you can uh, yeah. take us through. So on this slide, we will uh, deal with the question how accountants have to reflect the potential non-compliance penalties uh, in uh, the books. As Emily already mentioned, uh, the penalty under DEC 6 is uh, basically uh, uh, upon discretionary of the member states uh, if it's, uh, with respect to the, the amount. Um, it's a penalty and uh, it's not an, uh, an income tax. So in this regard, it's not being governed by um, AFRIC 23 of um, IS uh, 740. Um, so um, basically, for uh, penalties, the normal uh, way of accounting for uh, fines and penalties, etc., will, uh, according to our opinion, be applied here. 
and the question whether then you can maybe make an in provision for a penalty um, would be rather uh, a strange one because um, if you know that you are doing something uh, wrong it's not uh, moral to uh, provide for that yeah there's a there's a i think the accountants are still struggling with this unless they follow a very rigid line of uh, of uh, thinking uh, market because it, it, if it's a fine and there's a, 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 even the slightest probability that the fine will hit the corporate i guess the accountant wants to see it booked yeah, or he will uh, uh, probably look at it in, in maybe in the general context of how to uh, provide for uh, certain risks, risks within the company. Um, um, but it's not covered uh, in, in, in the context of uh, certain tax positions. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, we will uh, treat it for tax purposes as, an, uh, as a permanent difference, as being non-deductible. Okay. Okay, um, so a little bit more about the tax six people. Uh, I explained that the uh, reporting obligation can fall to both on uh, both the intermediary or uh, the taxpayer, the company. So, uh, um, for those of you who are in-house uh, tax counsel, the in-house tax uh, advisors, what does the tax six mean for you, and uh, what sort of what do you uh, have to consider uh, for in with respect to tax six? So I, uh, we recommend that it is uh, um, important for you to engage with your advisor and uh, agree on uh, the approach as to how you can monitor your advisor uh, are planning to disclose for consistency and accuracy and uh, where it is possible, develop a policy to reduce the number of uh, disclosures by uh, agreeing in advance who will file and by ensuring what other intermediaries have the proof, required proof they need for uh, non-reporting. And uh, remember that in uh, some, a lot of cases, uh, there may be an initial um, tax arrangement uh, that was initially uh, uh, created, but uh, um, those uh, arrangements from time to time will be updated and they will change. So you will need to uh, keep track of uh, of the changes uh, that made on your arrangement. And um, also it's quite important for you to understand where uh, national legislation, um, each uh, EU member state uh, has uh, different legislations and they don't necessarily, they are not necessarily exactly um, what the EU directive says. So uh, you will need to understand the uh, requirements for each uh, specific uh, legislation. Um, and uh, because uh, the whole, um, the main purpose of the uh, mandatory disclosure is that it gives more. Um, I well, I, I would I would not like to use. I wouldn't go as far as giving leads, but it does give information to the tax authorities, and hence that uh, gives them more uh, of a menu for activities to audit. So it is quite possible that uh, uh, making uh, such a disclosure will uh, lead to increased uh, um, possi greater possibility of um, tax audits. Um, would you like to uh, elaborate on that state or should we move on? Um, I think that this is sort of the the dilemma for the in-house tax team. Huh? Do we do we leave the intermediates to take over the, the decision for reporting or not, huh? depending on the intermediates' uh, interpretation of hallmarks, or um, what we recommend corporates uh, take a take a more proactive approach and at least uh, start the communication with your advisors uh, who are involved uh, in things like that. Uh, yesterday I was talking to uh, one of our network colleagues in, in Germany who says that uh, the corporate lawyers who are involved in doing cross-border structuring um, uh, suddenly, and, and typically a law firm has the corporate lawyers who, who create the legal framework for a deal, suddenly are the considered under this DAC 6 the uh, the, 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 the persons who have to report DAC 6 uh, type of uh, transactions uh, who, who meet the hallmarks uh, to, to the tax authorities while 
obviously these corporate lawyers uh, are not uh, per se truly um, informed, uh, trained, and, and, and even in the in the slightest uh, mindset uh, interested to start doing reporting for for these things to tax authorities. But uh, that 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 was sort of a concern that people who are not necessarily involved in tax, although tax is a side shoot of the work they do, uh, fully get pulled into the, the reporting. Uh, again, that means um, corporates uh, protect yourself and make a good stakeholder analysis and uh, make sure you have a good communication between uh, your intermediates uh, and, and yourself to uh, avoid that under or over reporting or the mismatch in reporting between the intermediates and the, and the corporates. So, so what is really the comparison, uh, the, the, the overlap and versus the difference, uh, DAC6 and uh, UTPs? I think the, the, uh, the scope is uh, kind of similar. But, uh, uh, the taxes based on income is a big chunk of what we're looking at. Um, that that is for DAC six as well as for uh, uh, N forty eight or EFIC uh, twenty three. Uh, the eff effective date we we talked about, uh, so it's it's all relatively new uh, legislation. Uh, but the purpose is clear. DAC six is a, a disclosure to EU tax authorities. It's not clear whether that at a later stage will will lead to further disclosure to the public domain in a, in a blame and shame type of list. I, I know that uh, the intermediates who are not fully cooperating with this could land on a blacklist. Uh, so I guess that, that uh, it will hit the public domain one day, uh, but maybe in a delayed manner. Uh, while obviously the, the 1048 type of approaches are, are uh, creating that full transparency to, to especially shareholders who put their money on the line and want to know uh, not only the reporter tax risk positions but maybe also the UTPs. Um, recognition is, uh, is, is, is different. One is more probability and, and the other is, is clearly is the value of the transaction which uh, which is at risk uh, to the to the fullest. Uh, the the visuals uh, uh, underneath sort of show what what is happening here. The intermediate and clients both have a reporting obligation in uh, in the sequence: intermediate first, client sub subsequently, to tax authorities uh, with an automatic exchange. And as I just indicated maybe this this picture should be expanded to tax authorities who start issuing uh, blame and shame lists to uh, to the public domain at, at the later stage where while in certain tax positions uh, books get checked by the auditor and a client uh, through a 10k and, uh, needs to disclose those UTPs to the public domain and uh, that's a that's a wider group of people. Um, be before we now draw a conclusion, what is the relationship? Um, uh, if you report for DAC six, um, should you report for FIN forty eight or the other way around? Uh, we we have a few examples where we sort of try to approach the, the on on a set of facts the DAC six uh, uh, hallmarks uh, versus the UTP criteria to give you a little bit more feel for real cases and then I think we uh, we close down with that question I just uh, just raised yeah so we move on then to the uh, example the first example we um, this slide will be shared by uh, Emily and myself I will start with the uh, the uncertain tax position ramifications so we have an example here where an m and &E sets a, a group policy for royalty rates uh, in connection with branding. Uh, it sets the rate at 3% of total sales. It has uh, to uh, substantiate this 3% It has uh, basically obtained a benchmark study. And uh, this shows that uh, an interquartal range between 1 and 6 with a median of 2% is considered at arm's length. 
Now, generally, when uh, uh, you apply a transfer pricing policy uh, on a group-wide basis, um, you may have to make sure that the, the transfer pricing policy is um, at least at suit level or, or highly certain. Um, cost durational is uh, very simple. You would not uh, implement such a policy if you already know that, um, for instance, you need to, um, under FIN 48 or um, ISC 740, uh, to start providing already for um, inserted text positions. That also means that, um, uh, generally speaking, uh, you take the position that uh, as long as you are in between this, the 1 and 6%, uh, whatever happens, uh, you, you do not take an asserted text position. Because uh, as soon as you ca start creating uh, exceptions, you're undermining uh, basically the, the uh, shoot or highly certain position you have taken in uh, implementing this uh, policy. The only way you can get around that uh, is if you are uh, able to uh, demonstrate that it is a, an exceptional case uh, which you have at hand. Um, I mean, we could think about certain uh, tax jurisdictions which are uh, falling beyond, beyond or outside the scope of uh, normal, um, yeah, normal OCT type, uh, UN type of, uh, of uh, legislative uh, countries or being part of OECD or, or UN and have a very uh, particular approach towards uh, the assessment of, of royalties. In such case, you would uh, uh, be able to demonstrate that uh, towards your auditors that a provision for uncertain, for an uncertain tax position may be justified. Um, would you do that? Uh, would that be the case here? Then uh, I think the 1% difference in, in royalty rate, uh, if you consider that this uh, comp this, this country where we're talking about does not accept uh, anything which is not the median, then 1% of the total sales in this case would be then uh, subject to um, estimation for uncertain tax position. So to uh, this uh, sort of uh, fact, this fact scenario here, would you need to make a disclosure on the tax fix? Um, that would be the case if uh, the recipient of the royalty is uh, in a tax the preferential tax regime country, and uh, if that is the case, then the main uh, tax benefit test would be met. And uh, if, the, if you remember um, the hallmarks uh, from earlier explanation, hallmark C1 would be met, which is uh, making uh, payments to a related party and the pay payment benefits from a preferential uh, tax regime. And uh, especially if the end in this case uh, the group policy for the royalty uh, rate would have been would have had to have been implemented after 25 June 2018 for the tax fix uh, um, initiative to apply, um, and of course the transaction would have had to take place between um, tax jurisdiction um, in the EU state. Then the, uh, mandatory disclosure reporting um, uh, is required. Okay, then we, uh, thank you, Emily. Then we move on to example two. two. Um, in this case, we have an, uh, an hard to value intangible from a restructuring. Um, and the group is uh, basically aiming to centralize its IP by transferring all IP from target companies to a central IP company. And as a result, the valuation of an intangible has, has been taken place uh, a couple of years ago. So when we then, um, a couple of years later, um, are basically uh, confronted with, an, um, with new information, then um, uh, we have to evaluate this new information and basically uh, consider whether this gives rise to a uh, revaluation of the uncertain position and whether then maybe it can be concluded that the position has become uh, uncertain um, in that it is not any more 70% um, certain or uh, highly certain. Um, so if that would be the case, um, so based on new information, we have to uh, come to the conclusion that uh, the position is no longer uh, certain and uh, needs to be evaluated and we have to um, and basically take a provision for the uh, amount. Um, 
which is uncertain, then um, yeah, you can you have to take a provision um, in, in essence. Basically, you are uh, ending up with an uncertain tax position in, in either country, and um, depending on whether there is a, a corresponding uh, mechanism um, for adjustments uh, in the treaties between the countries, you have to apply uh, for a provision in case the uh, tax rate is not uh, the same in both countries. And uh, would this uh, um, the arrangement uh, have to be reported on the taxes? Um, the answer is yes. The uh, whole market E, the transfer pricing whole market is smashed uh, because uh, with the, um, the whole market E, where there is a, a, a cross border arrangement involves a transfer of hard to value intangible, um, you don't, the, the main benefit, the main objective of the arrangement does not have to be for, for of, of, on object, obtaining a tax benefit. Um, so yes, they would. It, it is required to make a disclosure under Act 6 for this uh, scenario. Okay, then uh, example three, the last example. Here we are dealing with a deductible cost for the payment between related entity uh, in relation to an intergroup debt between uh, a relevant entity and its uh, Bermuda parent. Yeah, there can be, of course, uh, um, in this case, an, an, an uncertain tax position, um, and that might be uh, subject to disclosure. Yeah, if, uh, that's correct, Mark. Um, the deductible payments are being made to a low tax jurisdiction, which is uh, one of the um, points on the uh, home C, and that the, a disclosure would be required if the structure was implemented after uh, 25 June 2018. So a question um, for you to, uh, to, uh, to think about is, uh, so if a disclosure for an uncertain tax position is made, is uh, DAC6 uh, mandatory disclosure requirement also likely to be made and vice versa? Um, you could uh, say uh, that, that it could be made, but uh, as uh, we have discussed, uh, they are um, two uh, different uh, um, uh, disclosures and uh, each uh, case has to be assessed uh, on its own merits. Um, and they have, um, I guess uh, both uh, of the disclosures have uh, the common goal of uh, transparency and um, they do uh, involve uh, disclosing of uh, um, say, uh, aggressive uh, tax arrangements, but um, they are two uh, different disclosure requirements. Uh, uncertain uh, tax position is the, the main piece is uh, to do with uh, um, ascertaining uh, the position of tax, whereas uh, Mandatory disclosure uh, tax fix requirement um, involves uh, disclosure of uh, tax arrangements. Do you have any? Would you like to add anything to that, Mark? Yeah, maybe one general observation is that um, in case you have to disclose under tax six, um, normally you you would be uh, comfortable about the certainty of the tax position you you are taking. It's not very um, likely or uh, very wise to implement a tax planning scheme from which you already know uh, at the outset that it will not be uh, or for which you need to record an uncertain tax position. Um. On that note, uh, does uh, everyone, anyone have questions? I have not received any um questions uh, but uh, if you do have questions uh, feel free to post it and we can discuss it otherwise uh, um, feel uh, free to uh, email uh, uh, myself or Mark uh, um, and uh, um, actually there is uh, one question um, the question says if an intercompany loan agreement stipulates variable interest rates um, for example, interest rates uh, change yearly under the group interest intercompany rate interest rate policy. Would this be uh, reportable under Tax Six? 
So the question is uh, asking um, about a variable uh, interest rate. Well, I think uh, um, that would depend on what, uh, it's not so much that the interest rate area is variable. It's uh, the whole mask uh, talks about where the deductible interest payment is being made to on the um, whole max C1. Um, and if it, it is interest uh, payment is being made to a preferential tax regime or where there is low tax or no tax uh, jurisdiction, um, then uh, uh, a disclosure needs to be made. Um, what, what is your opinion, Mark? Um. Now, my first question would be, is the loan, uh, when was the loan concluded? Yes. Is it before uh, um, June 2018? Then I think it's it's not reportable. Um, if the if it is a normal interest, uh, but variable based on uh, on on basically the uh, market conditions of uh, of borrowing by the group, then I would say it's not reportable. But if it would be uh, a variable as a consequence of um, any special um, tax-driven elements in the instrument, uh, or um, have, for instance, would it be a type of, uh, of a hybrid, or would the interest be considered uh, uh, excessive, um, then um, we might end up with, an, uh, with an, a reportable transaction on the DEX6. Okay, um, and uh, that was the uh, only question. Um, and I think uh, on that note, uh, thank you very much for attending the webinar, and uh, we hope to uh, speak to you again soon.